please, in your Bibles, to the book of Job, the 36th chapter. Job chapter 36, in your Schofield Bible, page 592. And we'll read the first six verses, reading the verses responsibly. Job 36, verses 1 through 6, reading the verses responsibly. And let's stand, please, all of us standing for the reading of God's Word. I want to point out that the second verse is the text verse. Elihu also proceeded and said, Suffer me a little, and I will show thee that I have yet to speak on God's behalf. I will fetch my knowledge from afar, and will ascribe righteousness to my Maker. For truly my words shall not be false. He that is perfect in knowledge is with thee. Behold, God is mighty, and despiseth not any. He is mighty in strength and wisdom. He preserveth not the life of the wicked, but giveth right to the poor. And let's pray. Father, bless, we pray the service. We uh, await now the preaching. We need whatever the preacher is going to bring. Thou hast put it upon his heart. We would do very well to listen. Help us to not only to listen, but to drink it in as one who is thirsty who feasts upon thy word tonight as one who is hungry. Furnish thou our need, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, our Heavenly Father, we come to a place so familiar for us that it could be commonplace, may it never be so. We come to stand for God as his representative for these moments. And I pray we shall stand aright and speak the word that thou hast told us to say. Control these moments as we meet together and hear God's message from God's servant, poor servant, weak and feeble, but sincere. And I pray you bless the message to our hearts this evening. Amen. Tonight I am purposely <coughs> going to address only a part of this crowd. I am sure that all of you will listen, but I'm going to do something that I rarely ever do, and I'm going to single out some of you, <laughs> I think, perhaps, the majority of you, and uh, speak to you. I'm going to bypass tonight my attention uh, I'm going, in my attention, I'm going to bypass the <coughs> the uh, soul winners. I'm not going to say anything tonight, basically, to those people who stand on Madison Street in Chicago and other streets and preach the gospel while pedestrians pass by and while Chicago engages in its busy activities. I shall not in direct my message toward you. Nor will I direct my message tonight <laughs> toward those that go to O'Hare Field and witness there in the airport as people from all over the world assemble in that great cosmopolitan center. I will not basically address you. Nor <laughs> am I tonight going to spend my time talking to the foster clubs, the ladies soul winning clubs in our church, nor am I going to address primarily the fishermen's club, nor the Friday morning soul winning group, nor the F Sunday school crowd, nor the great host of bus workers in this building. I'm going to shock you now and I want to show you something. I want everybody who went visiting for Jesus, for this church, for the for soul winning on a bus route, foster club, fisherman's club. If this, in the, since last Sunday night, we we're here. <coughs> if you this week have knocked on doors for the cause of Christ, I want you to raise your hand, would you please? All over the house. <coughs> All over the house. Look around there. Look around you. You may lower your hands. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you didn't, if you did not. <coughs> However, though that looked like the entire crowd, 
it was probably a third of the crowd. One hand out of five can be listed and it'll appear to be everybody. We have about two to 3,000 people every week that go out and knock on doors, and that's wonderful. That's uh, This tonight, you are a member or a part of what is as near what Jesus intended the church to be as you will find anywhere in the world. It's unbelievable what you saw tonight. <laughs> there are churches all across America that nobody ever knocks on a door. Nobody ever tries to win a soul. But tonight I'm going to address those of you whose hands were not raised. No, I do not plan to rebuke you. I'm not going to scathe, scald, or scold. <laughs> I, I do not plan to in any way rebuke you or chasten you because of the fact that you are not involved actively in some kind of a soul winning ministry in this church. I would, however, like to <laughs> exhort you and lovingly recommend something to you, sort of as a, as a minimum. Now, by the way, there are hundreds of folks in this room who do not go soul winning, who are delightful, nice, courteous, generous, tithing, gracious, loving, loyal people. And I, I mean that. <laughs> I'm not talking to a bunch of folks now who, who, uh, who, uh, got drunk last night. I'm talking to folks who, who had, who never participate in such things as drinking, smoking, uh, movie going, dancing, gambling. Are you listening? I'm talking about people who are good, solid people. I want you to hear me now. I, uh, <laughs> I'm not talking about a bunch of, uh, I mean, I believe that the people in this room tonight are the most separated uh, collection of believers anywhere in the world today. Now, we have not yet apprehended, <laughs> and I'd like to take some of you and, uh, and, and wash you and clean you and bathe you uh, of your habits, of your music, of your television itinerary, and so forth. But I want to address tonight <laughs> that great company of people in this room who love God as, as I mean, as best you can. You believe the Bible. You're convinced it's the Word of God. And you read it some. And you want your children to grow up and be decent citizens. And uh, you pray. You say grace at the table. <laughs> and you are sincere uh, in this matter of trying to be a decent person. But if you were honest, you would have to say the words that Elihu spoke to Job when he said, I have yet to speak on God's behalf. Add that to your scriptures <laughs> that are sad <laughs> and uh, heart-rending. Add this to your list of sad verses, such as, uh, I looked on my right hand. Are you listening? Are you listening? Young people? Young couple back there, I want you to look at me while I'm preaching. No talking. Young lady, did you hear me? Uh, I'm not up here because my lungs need exercise. You need to hear what I've got to say. I spent a whole sermon on that last Wednesday night. And if I've got to tie you in straight jackets, I'm going to get you to hear what I've got to say. What I have to say tonight is so vital. So vital. If it weren't, I'd say something that was vital. But uh, <coughs> I am... Um, you can add that to the scripture. I looked on my right hand. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. You can add to the scripture the sad one. Um, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. Or the scripture that says, Remember Lot's wife. Those sad passages of scripture that break our hearts at their reading. This one is, is, is equally sad. Elihu said to Job, I have yet to speak on God's behalf. I have yet to speak on God's behalf. It is sad but true that many people in this room tonight would have to say, if you're honest, I have yet to speak on God's behalf. There are dozens and dozens and probably hundreds of people in this room tonight who've never in your life ever spoken a word to a sinner about Christ. 
Now, you're good people. <laughs> you're fine folks. You love God as best you can. You come to church on Sunday morning. Many of you come back on Sunday night. Many of you are here on Wednesday night. But to, to sad but true, <laughs> you'd have to say with Elihu, I have yet to speak on God's behalf. Isn't that a sad statement? I have yet to speak on God's behalf. Think of it. A person been saved for 50 years would have to be honest and say, I have yet to speak on God's behalf. Think of it. A person been saved 10 years or so and says, I have yet to speak on God's behalf. Now, uh, you know who you are, and I'm not, I'm not gonna hurt you, hurt your feelings tonight. I just want to tell you that, that, that a little message to you and, uh, and see if I cannot beseech you to join in some way. No, I'm not going to ask you tonight to go down to Madison Avenue in Chicago, Madison Street in Chicago, and stand on the street corner. I'm not going to do it. And I'm not going to scathe you and scold you if you refuse to do it. To be quite frank with you, it's been quite a while since I've been down to Madison Street and preached on the street. I have preached on the street corner. Now, I'm, I'm for it 100%, and numbers of folks are saved. But I'm not asking that great crowd of people who'd have to say, I have yet to speak on God's behalf. I'm not asking you to do that. Nor am I going tonight to suggest that you go to O'Hare Field and then join the Hare Krishna people of a side then and, and, and get folks to come off the airplane. As I, I was in, in Birmingham, Alabama not long ago. I got off the airplane and a fellow walked up to me and he said, how do you do, sir? Welcome to Birmingham. Well, I thought, boy, oh boy, this fellow must be representing the mayor. He said, welcome to Birmingham. He said, uh, where are you going when you die? And the guy was there welcoming the people who got off the airport and trying to get them saved. Now, I think that's wonderful. And that's New Testament Christianity. But I'm not going to try to ask you folks tonight who would have to say, I have yet to stop and preach a sermon with your, with the, uh, uh, little smock around you. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to do that. Uh, I'm not talking about it. I'm not even going to ask you. Uh, recently I, uh, picked up the newspaper and saw that the Baker Hotel in Dallas had been, um, had been uh, torn down, demolished. Baker Hotel, when I was a boy, was the most famous hotel in Dallas. I recall we used to send a bunch of, nut, a bunch of soul winners down there to uh, <coughs> down to the witness. <coughs> and they tried to get folks to listen to them. Uh, the, the businessmen in this elite hotel, and uh, <coughs> it was the Statler Hilton of those days, or the Hyatt Regency of those days. And so they go down there in the lobby, <coughs> nobody listened to them. So our guys, they start singing. But a bunch of just old guys couldn't carry a lick and uh, Tune the sack and uh, couldn't sing a lick, <laughs> and then start singing. And a, and a crowd would gather. And as soon as the crowd gathered, they'd start preaching to them. You want to take this and want to take that one and get them saved. And uh, oh my, you you wouldn't believe all the trouble we caused down there in the lobby of that hotel. I'm not suggesting that you do that. Now hold it. I think it's fine. And you folks are doing it. I'm glad you do. But I'm talking tonight to that crowd of people who'd have to say, I have yet to speak on God's behalf. I'm talking to you. I'm not asking you to start off in the lobby of the Baker Hotel or the lobby of the Statler Hilton, the lobby of the Holiday Inn, singing and witnessing to folks. I'm not, ask, I'm not asking you to preach on a street corner. I'm not even asking you to get a bus route. I think many of you should. But tonight, the purpose of this message is not to try to, for, to in, in, enthuse you or, or inspire you to get a bus route. Nor am I trying to get you in this message to even join the Foster Club. I think many of you should. I think that all of us ought to go to some kind of soul wedding, but I'm not asking, this message is not for that. I'm not suggesting that you join the Fisherman's Club, the uh, Friday morning soul wedding, the Tuesday night soul wedding, uh, get a bus route. Uh, for this message, I want to talk to you people who would have to say, I have yet to speak on God's behalf, and I want to bypass these things that I've mentioned. I want you just as a minimum. And I think everybody in this church ought to have as a minimum just occasionally telling somebody about Jesus. Now, any Christian ought to do that. I mean, the paper boy, you could just say to him, uh, you wouldn't want to go to heaven, would you? I mean, just say something. Uh, the paper boy, certainly everybody ought to at least sometime Talk to the paper boy and say, son, or you, do you know if you died, you'd go to heaven. Now, everybody ought to do that. You said, preacher, I, 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 I can't speak on the street corner, and I, and I couldn't get up in the barber chair and preach, and I couldn't go out to the hotel lobby, and I couldn't, I, I couldn't have a bus route. Okay. 
But I want to talk to the crowd who would have to say with Job, I have yet to speak on God's behalf. Now that's a sin. That's wrong. And tonight, I'm not trying to enlist you in a soul winning club. I'm trying to say, look, you can tell your beautician about Christ. You can speak to your barber about Christ. And you may not even say, Barber, do you know that you're redeemed with the blood, the precious blood of Calvary? You know that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You don't have to say that. But you could sometimes say to your barber, uh, I'm a Christian, I sure do enjoy it. Or you could say to your barber, I, I, I trusted Jesus as my Savior. I hope you will someday. You could say that. Those of you who have to say, I have not yet I have yet to speak on God's behalf. Now, it seems impossible to believe that we would not want to speak on God's behalf. Did not God give His only begotten Son for us? Did not His Son become flesh and walk among men for us? Was, was He not born in a manger? And was there no room for Him in the inn for us? Was He not despised and rejected of men? Young people, are you listening? Was He not despised and rejected of men for us? Was He not a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief for us? <laughs> Was He not tried with a mock trial for us? Was He not beaten with a cat of nine tails beyond human recognition for us? Did He not die on the cross for us? Did not nails pierce His hands for us? Is it not true that the crown of thorns came on His brow for us? Did He not uh, give up the ghost for us? Did He not see the Father's high inside? And did He not cry, My God, My God, why hast Thou forsaken Me for us? Did He not die for us? Did He not suffer hell for us? Did He not rise again for us? Did He not ascend to the Father for us? Is He not tonight sitting on the right hand of the Father pleading our case as our lawyer, our mediator, our advocate, our attorney, <coughs> our daysman, our intercessor. Is He not doing that for us? Is He not merciful toward us? Is He not long-suffering toward us? Is He not patient toward us? Does He not feed us? Does He not clothe us? Does He not love us? Does He not provide the sunshine for us? Does He not provide the flowers of springtime for us? Does He not provide the snowy winter for us? Does He not forgive our sins? Did He not save us? Has He not prepared a place in heaven for us? Is He not coming again for us? Is He not going to receive us to Himself where we shall live with Him forever for us? It just seems like if He did all of that and multitudes more than that for us, it just seems like His weakest, timidest child ought to sometime, somewhere, say something good about him. You people, <laughs> the good people, buying people. But I mean, you're not going to become an evangelist. <laughs> you're not going to become a bus captain. You are a sitter. Your, <coughs> your contribution is <coughs> the offering in the envelope and covering 18 inches or more of a pew here in this church. Now listen to me. Don't you think that it took as much of the blood of Jesus to save you as it did me? Don't you think that God loves you as much as He loves me? Don't you think that Jesus died on the cross for you as much as He did me? Then don't you think the minimum ought to be sometime, at least occasionally, Speaking some good word, if nothing more than walking up to somebody and say, Sir, could I tell you something? I love Jesus. Is that too little to ask? Is that too little to ask? You say, Preacher, I can't build a bus route. Okay. I'm not preaching tonight to try to get you to build a bus route. I just believe that none of us ought to have to say with Elihu, I have yet to speak on God's behalf. Every single person redeemed with the blood of Jesus Christ ought to in some way speak on God's behalf. You know what Romans 10, 9 and 10 says. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, 
and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You recall Matthew 10, 32 and 33, where our Lord says that if we do not, if we confess him before men, he will confess us before our Father which is in heaven. But if we do deny him before men, he will deny us. You recall where in Romans 10, 11 it says, For whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. And Jesus admonished us that it's wrong to put our candle under a bushel. Now, ladies and gentlemen, maybe you think that some of us are fanatical. Maybe you think that some of us have gone to seed on this matter of soul winning. You like me. You like this church. This is your church. You plan to stay here. I'm glad you do. And you give your tithe. And you come to church. And you like the Bible teaching. And the Holy Spirit lessons have been a help to you. But now, look, there are many of you that, that you, we know, I know you're not going to preach on a street corner. <laughs> I know you're not going to pass out tracts. I know you're not going to have a bus route. I know you're not going to join the foster club. But I'm saying, at least somewhere, occasionally, along your schedule, tell somebody a good word about Jesus. That's not too much to ask. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss, and for contempt on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingle down. Did e'er such love and, and sorrow meet, or thorns compose the richer crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. And if your name is written in heaven, and if Jesus died for you, and if you are on your way to glory and saved from the fires of hell, somewhere, somehow, you ought to take time to tell somebody that you love Jesus. There are those. <laughs> There's the one who shared the same marriage altar with you. There's the one who entered, who shared the same bed with you. Are you listening? There's the one who entered <laughs> with you into a love union, and you became heirs of the grace of God in helping to reproduce and propagate the human race. There is that one whose name you bear. There is that one who has provided for you every meal you've eaten for years. There is that one who has worked and seen to it you have a house in which to live, you have heat, you have air conditioning, you have food to eat, you have clothes to wear for those years. It just seems to me that that person that shared with you the intimacies of life, it seems to me at least you could tell your husband that you love Jesus. Is that asking too much? Or do you care if he dies and goes to hell? Does it matter to you if he dies without God? It may be that you will not preach on Madison Street in Chicago. It may be that you will not bring 600 folks to Sunday school on buses on the first Sunday of the spring program. But ladies and gentlemen, or ladies or men, you can share with that one who brought your children into the world about Jesus. Or you could <laughs> tell that one who was in your own body and to whom you gave birth and for whom you entered into the jaws of death and whose little body or mouth and body was nourished at your own breast and whose body you bathed and clothed and whom you taught how to walk, how to talk, how to eat, by whose bed you stayed night after night as a nurse, At least you can tell your children how to go to heaven when they die. And yet the sad truth is, this building is filled tonight with people, who, who ladies, who never one time even said to their wives, their husbands, I love Jesus. And there, this room is filled tonight with children who've never heard their dad Say one time, I love Jesus. 
who've never heard their mother say one time, I love Jesus. I beseech you. I appeal to you because of the mercies of God and the goodness of God. By all means, take time to tell somebody. And do not live and die having to say with Elihu, I have yet to speak on God's behalf. Now here's why you don't do it. You don't do it because you think folks are not, not wanting to listen to it. You'd be surprised if you knew how many folks would like to hear how to be saved. You'd be shocked if you knew how many folks at work beside you would love for somebody to tell them how to be saved. But they think it's a sign of weakness on their part if they admit it. And you think they're hard. Listen, listen. I have witnessed. I told you how not long ago. I witnessed and won to Jesus. This Hall of Fame baseball player, Ted Williams. Now, I'll be honest with you. When I began to speak to Ted Williams about Jesus, I thought, good night, would he get a baseball bat and hit me in the head with it? Would he cuss me? <clears throat> but the truth is, that heart of the Hall of Fame baseball player was as hungry for the gospel as anybody I ever saw in my life. He was as easy to win as a child in the beginner department. He was hungry. And there are tens of thousands and millions of folks who are hungry for somebody to tell them. If somebody would just have enough courage to say, could I tell you about Jesus Christ? When I heard that Elvis Presley died, <laughs> I, uh, I was glad that one time I told Elvis Presley about Jesus. I was in the Stonely Hotel <laughs> going up to the 11th floor where KSKY, the radio station on which I broadcast, was, was headquartered. Coming back down to, from the 11th floor to the first floor, I saw Elvis Presley. It been years and years and years ago. And on a green satin suit, <coughs> the, uh, the, um, the uh, elevator operator, didn't have automatic elevators in those days, the elevator operator, she, uh, <coughs> she said, Woo! He kissed me. That's Elvis, not me. And uh, <coughs> she said, uh, He kissed me. <coughs> and, Oh, Elvis Presley kissed me. And I said, Sir, my name is Jack Hiles. Are you Elvis Presley? He said, Yes, I am. And I said, do you know that God loves you? And do you know that all of us are sinners? And do you know that Jesus Christ, we're on the elevator coming down, had to hurry. Do you know that Jesus Christ died for sinners? And if you'd trust Him as your Savior, God would save you. I didn't have time to go any farther. I did get the gospel to Him. And I was glad when I picked up the newspaper and saw the big bla the headline, Elvis Presley is dead! I was glad that these lips one time were not too timid to tell Him that God loves Him. I have yet to speak on God's behalf. I picked up the newspaper one morning, read these, these words, Senator Montoya is dead. Senator Montoya was from, from west, I think, from Mexico. Uh, Senator was on the Watergate uh, investigating committee. And I could not help but rejoice that I had at least told him how to be saved. I flew with him to Washington, D.C. one day, and I said, Mr. Montoya, I'm a Baptist preacher, and uh, I want to tell you something. Best news you ever heard in your life. There is a, a message of hope. I said all of us by nature are sinners. And, uh, and all of us because we're sinners owe a sin debt and are lost without God. But Jesus Christ, God incarnate, came, God in the flesh, and went to Calvary and paid the debt for your sins and for mine. And if you will receive Him as your Savior, you can be saved. He said, I'm not interested in listening. I, I'm not all about that. Didn't say He was saved or not. He just was too busy. But at least when I saw that He died, I was glad that one day, I told the senator at least one time in his life about Jesus Christ. I picked up the paper one day and saw that Adolph Rupp, the famous basketball coach of the University of Kentucky for many years, um, won more basketball games as a college coach than any coach in collegiate history, had died. I could not help but rejoice that one day I was flying between Chicago and Lexington, Kentucky, and Mr. Rupp was sitting across the aisle from me. I read it and over and I said, Mr. Rupp, my name is Jack Hiles. I'm one of your admirers. <laughs> I talked to him for a while, and while I talked to him, I said, just because, just for the record, I want to tell you how to be saved. Do you know that all men by nature are sinners, and that sinners are lost, but that Jesus Christ died on the cross to save sinners, and if you will trust Him as your Savior, you can be saved. You recall when Harry Truman <laughs> passed away, who was president of our nation. Between the time that he was president, the time that he died, <laughs> I met him on an airplane coming between Kansas City and Chicago, when I read that Mr. Truman was dead, I rejoiced that on an airplane I told Harry Truman how to be saved. 
I said, Mr. Truman, uh, I admire you in many ways, but I want to tell you something. I know you're a Baptist, but I want to tell you something. All men by nature are sinners. <laughs> sinners are lost without God. But God's Son came in the world, God in the flesh, to pay the price for sinners on the cross of Calvary, and Christ died for you. I was glad when I saw that Mr. Truman had died. I was glad that one day, on an airplane between Kansas City and Chicago, I told Harry Truman, the ex-president of our nation, how to be saved. And the truth is, if presidents don't get saved, they'll go to hell like everybody else. And if Hall of Fame baseball players don't get saved, they'll go to hell like anybody else. And if basketball coaches don't get saved, they'll go to hell like anybody else. And if uh, if senators don't get saved, they'll go to hell like anybody else. And if Elvis Presley didn't get saved, he's in hell just like anybody else is in hell without God tonight. Now listen, if there's a hell, if it's true that people who die without God burn in hell forever, and if you don't believe that, your name is not written in the book of life because you're doubting the truth of God's blessed book. I'm saying this, if it be true, why in the world, why in the world, do not we at least tell those the dearest to us and the closest to us at least how they ought to be saved. Have you ever sat down and told your little boy the plan of salvation? Or are you going to let the school teacher cheat you of that blessing? Have you ever sat down and told your child about Jesus and how to be saved? Or are you going to let the Sunday school teacher cheat you of that blessing? Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, every single Christian ought to be able to say, I have spoken on God's behalf. It may just be to your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister, your mother, your father. I was on an airplane. Well, I, I picked the paper one day. I heard on the video of the death of Senator Everett Dirksen. I think one of the finest United States senators our country's had in our lifetime. I remember that morning I boarded an airplane <coughs> to O'Hare Field. I flew to uh, Washington, D.C. Two o'clock in the morning, I boarded a plane. I was on the front seat. My light was on. I was working. Nobody else was working except me and this one other light on, <laughs> the entire airplane, everybody else leaving. I turned around to see who the other fellow was who was working at two o'clock in the morning. <coughs> it was Senator Everett Dirksen. I leaned across the seat and said, Mr. Dirksen, I'm one of your admirers. And I told him that night that there was a gospel of grace. I told him that men by nature are sinners, and sinners are lost, and people are lost without God. Christ died for them and paid the penalty for our sin. The other day I was on the airplane and I, uh, a gal got on, a big, heavy set, uh, well upholstered black lady. She had diamond rings everywhere. I mean, boy, she had diamonds all over her. And, uh, she had a, an entourage with her. <coughs> One fellow said, folks would get on and say, Hello, Gloria. Hello, Gloria. Hi, Gloria. And would you believe it? Her seat was next to me. She sat down beside me, and I put on my sunglasses because of the diamond sparkling. And uh, <coughs> I said, My name is Jack Hiles. And she said, My name is Gloria Gaynor. I think Gaynor is the word, isn't it? You, you don't, don't think I'm trying to trick you now. She's the queen of disco, Gloria Gaynor. And uh, <coughs> uh, I... And... Uh, she said, I'm Gloria Gaynor. And boy, everybody around started looking and talking. And, and she was the talk of the airplane. And I said, Miss Gaynor, if you'll forgive me, <coughs> could I ask you what kind of business you're in? She was really a very gracious lady. She said, <coughs> I'm a singer. And I said, are you a gospel singer or are you a secular singer? And she was very gracious again. <coughs> and she said, I am a secular singer. They call me the queen of disco. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> Man alive. <laughs> you talk about the ducks on the pond. They were there. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> now, she was very gracious, honestly. She was very nice. And I, I said, I'm sorry. I know I should know you. I know you're a famous person. And uh, <clears throat> I know I should know who you are. <clears throat> but I said, I'm, I'm a... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm outdated. I don't know anything about disco. And uh, I, uh, I, I, I don't know who you are. And she said, that's okay. I understand that. That's perfectly all right. And she was very kind. But do you think I was going to meet the queen of disco and not tell her how to go to heaven? I mean, don't you think that... Don't you, look, suppose that she's not saved. And suppose one day she dies without God. What kind of Christian would I be? Now, if you want to keep on living like that <coughs> and say... 
I have yet to speak on God's behalf. That's your business. But, okay, I'm not, I'm saying, okay, don't join the soul winning club. And don't get a bus route. And don't speak on the street corner. And don't stand up in a, in a, in a barbershop chair and preach, okay. You're not that way and you're not gonna do it, okay. But I beseech you in God's name, somewhere along the line, speak on God's behalf. You could, uh, <coughs> quietly speak a word to an insurance man. Paper boy, <laughs> barber, hairdresser, doctor. You'd be shocked if you knew how many doctors are hungry for Jesus. Several years ago, before we owned this building, we called the Spanish building over here. <laughs> I was the, uh, there was a barber shop over there. And I went over one day, I was in a hurry, and I went over one day and, and, and got a haircut. I'd never been there before. Nobody was there but me that day. <laughs> the barber was cutting my hair. He cut my hair, and I didn't walk in and say, Good morning, barber. Have you been regenerated by the power of the Holy Ghost of God? Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Can you stop and think what the Lamb's Book of Life would sound like to somebody that doesn't know the Bible? You know, I never saw a lamb read a book, did you? Or write a book. <coughs> the Lamb's Book of Life. Have you been re... You know, you, you've seen them. Walk up and say, Hello there. I'm a child of the king. Well, they think you're Prince Charles or somebody. <coughs> and I'm a child of the king. The glorious gospel of Jesus Christ is reached to my heart. And my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. My sins are gone, 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 gone. Hallelujah! Now, <laughs> folks, that old dog never treated a coon. I didn't walk in a barber shop and say, Hello, barber, dirty sinner, here comes a righteous man. Holy, 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 holy. I walked in. Is there a nursery where I can put that lady over there? <laughs> I walked in. <laughs> I said, how'd the Cubs do yesterday? Well, everybody knows how they did. They lost. We chatted a while. He said, aren't you the reverend across the street? I said, no, I'm the pastor across the street. I'm not reverend. He said, I've heard an awful lot about you. <laughs> I hate that statement. <laughs> I hate that one. And I looked at him. Before I started to get up and leave. I paid him. I looked at him and I said, sir, you have a broken heart. He told me about a heartbreak he had with one of his children. And I said, sir, let me tell you somebody that loves you. And that barber I'd never seen in my life before melted. I didn't, I didn't act like a preacher. He melted before I left that place. <laughs> he was on his knees receiving Christ as Savior. I am, um, I, I, I've been trading for years, some, <coughs> uh, out at the Dell service station. Started 20, 21 and a half years ago. I always buy some gasoline out there, and for years, it's the only place I ever traded. And a man, Dell Henson, and uh, I, I like the guy, and he always, Hello, Reverend, how's it going? Where you been this time? And so forth. And I like to chit-chat like that. And I witnessed the Dell one day, and he said to me, Reverend, he said, uh, <coughs> I have received Christ. He said, however, my dad, I think he said he's 84 years old, he's very, very ill. He said, would you, uh, could you go see my dad? Now, who would think that the fellow that owned the service station would need somebody to go see his dad? I went to see his dad in his 80s, went to see him, and there in the house I led his dad to Jesus Christ. He couldn't come to church, he was too sick, so we had a private baptism for him one day. He came up and was baptized here in the church, <coughs> a little private baptismal ceremony just for the father of the service station attendant. I was out in, in Highland um, at, at a dentist office. I uh, <coughs> I hate to go to the dentist office. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate, I hate the world, the flesh, and the dentist. And uh, <coughs> I, uh, oh my, and uh, I got a hole in my teeth right now. I'm going to have to have it filled. Every time I eat a hamburger, half of it lodges up in there in that one little spot. And uh, that way you can pick it out and eat the rest of it later on. And uh, <coughs> so uh, <coughs> I... Uh, <coughs> I, I went to the, we went to the same dentist <coughs> for years, for years, <coughs> same dentist. And uh, I, I had spoken a good word about Jesus to the dentist's wife. She worked for him, and they, they no longer live in this area, but uh, but she worked for him. <coughs> and uh, she was his receptionist and his nurse. And uh, so, she, young people, are you listening? Hey! So uh, she, uh, I tried to witness to her. 
She never was interested. Never. <laughs> One day I was sitting in the office reading the 1938 Saturday Evening Post. And, uh, <laughs> and many of you have heard me tell the story. An old lady walked in. She had tennis shoes on. She was very poor. She had a handkerchief like this. <laughs> Brother O'Claire. <laughs> I, this, was, this, this morning it was a baby. <laughs> this actually was a baby. And Brother Claire said, I hate to see you blow your nose on that baby uh, later on in the sermon. And uh, but anyway, I, uh, I said, this wasn't the baby. This is the blanket. I blew my nose on the blanket, not the baby. But this lady came in in the dentist's office. I was waiting there. And, uh, and uh, she, she, she had her teeth, false teeth, bloody false teeth in her handkerchief. And she said uh, to the dentist's wife, she said, my teeth don't fit. My teeth don't fit. She said, I don't even have my teeth fixed, so my teeth are fit. The dentist's wife said, Mary, I'm sorry, but uh, your, your guarantee is up, and there's no way you can do it. I can't help it. And she said, Mary, you should have come sooner. I couldn't come sooner. It's been cold, and I don't have any way to get here. I don't have a car. My teeth don't fit, and I... Well, you got to buy some more. I can't afford any more teeth, and uh, I'm going to have my teeth to fit. The dentist's wife said, kindly, but, 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 but frankly, she said... There's nothing we can do. The guarantee's up. And I said, what would it cost for Mary to have a new set of false teeth? And the dentist wife said, <laughs> over $400, Reverend. And I said, okay, then give her a new set and put it on my bill. She said, I didn't know you knew Mary. I said, I just met her when she walked in. Never saw her before. I said, put it on my bill. Two days later, <laughs> I got a call. Secretary Busman said, your dentist's wife wants to talk to you. I, I said, hello. And she said, Reverend, this is a dentist's wife. She said, I haven't slept in two nights. She said, I keep thinking about what you offer, uh, what you're going to, going to do for that, that old lady having those false teeth made for her. She said, I can't, I can't sleep. She said, I believe you let me come to your office. I can get saved now. I didn't have to go see her. She had curb service and came to my office and got saved. There's nothing wrong with the word. Is there anything wrong with a Christian? Everyone's, I'm not saying you've got to be a pious prude. I'm not saying you've got to carry a 75-foot Bible with you everywhere you go. You haven't got to see a 900-foot Jesus. Let all robbers do all that stuff. You haven't got to do that. You haven't got to walk going burgers to the supermarket and say, Woo! Glory to God! My name is written in look. You haven't got to do that. I don't care if you do it, do it, and I'm not going to criticize you. But it just seems to me that everybody who's, who's, who's a Christian ought to be able to tell somebody about it. Let's agree that you're not going to have a bus route. Let's agree that you're not going to go to soul winning or the foster club. Could I appeal to you tonight? Every single one of us, just as somewhere along the way, ever once in a while, just tell somebody a good word about Jesus. Let's talk about Jesus. The King of kings is He. The Lord of lords supreme through all eternity. The great I am, the way, the truth, the life, the door. Let's talk about Jesus more and more. I, I fly on airplanes across this country. <coughs> I never get on the airplane. Put my collar on backwards. Get my Bible out. May I have your airborne attention, please? <laughs> there is another flight that you must take besides this one. That flight is a transuniversal flight. Be sure your seat belts are fastened. Somebody has paid your ticket. I never do that. I get on the airplane, work. I don't say to the stewardess when she comes by, <coughs> Stewardess, are you covered in the robe of righteousness? Is the blood of Jesus dripping down your... What's that? Uh, what's the thing you wear when you cook? Apron. Yeah, apron. Those big words always throw me. <coughs> I don't say that. <coughs> One day I was on the airplane, the stewardess came by, and I had a Bible. She said, you want a bloody... Mm, you wouldn't want a bloody Mary, would you? She came by again, and she would you like to have a screwdriver? You wouldn't want a screwdriver. Yeah. <coughs> I didn't say, 
ma'am, a screwdriver is, has in it intoxicating beverages. And our Lord Jesus says that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, I do not indulge in such iniquity. It is not pleasing to my wonderful Jesus. I didn't say that. And she came by. <laughs> and she said, she, she, she passed me by, and she stumbled right in front of me and spilled a glass of whiskey all over my britches. Now, how does a preacher account for that odor? I did not take a glass of it. I will say that I did squeeze the britches out tightly, and <coughs> but I, uh, I, uh, she said, "Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me." Oh, she said, "I'm so, of all the people on the airplane, I didn't want to spill any whiskey on at you." I said, "Look, ma'am, I didn't say, oh, my soul, Jesus is displeased with you." Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and Paul, and John, John the Baptist are watching you at this very moment. I didn't say that. I said, look, that's okay. Anybody could stumble and spill something. Don't worry about that. In those days, I used to sell books and bring the money home and, and put it in a book fund. <laughs> I don't do it anymore. But I, uh, I had a $700 in a little bank first. Thing. I left that stupid thing on the airplane. Got up in the terminal and it dawned on me. Oh, my soul, that's $700. I ran back to the airplane. She was running to meet me, trying to find me. She would saved it for me. And I told her about Jesus. And she said, Mr. You're the nicest manager I've ever flown on my airplane. She said, I'm sorry, I spilled it on you. And I got to tell her about Jesus. I'm not asking you to become a fool or a nut. I'm just saying, if you work at a grocery store, couldn't you sometime at least tell the grocerman a good word about him? Huh? You're not ashamed of me at work, are you? Don't answer that. Then why should you be ashamed of Jesus? A fellow came to me one time and said, uh, <coughs> I heard a man cuss you, Brother Hiles, on the job. I said, what would you tell him? He said, if I ever hear that one time, he grabbed a hammer. I'm wrapping this hammer around your neck. I prayed he'd do it another time. But... Uh, let me be pleased. Don't you think it'd please Jesus if he could hear you every once in a while tell somebody that you love him? I uh, <coughs> I used to work for J.C. Penney Company in uh, East Texas, when I was in college. Good night. It's been 113 years ago. And uh, I I worked for 60 cents an hour at J.C. Penney Company. So we, what I did the first day? <laughs> I walked in J.C. Penney Company. I said, salesmen and sales ladies, clerks and secretaries, here hearken unto my voice. Friends and countrymen, heed my message of redeeming grace. I didn't do that. <coughs> First thing I did was I worked hard enough to sell more clothes than any other salesman in, in J.C. Penney. And one by one, when the chance came, <coughs> I won Mr. Sharp to Jesus. He worked in the in the uh, men's department. And I won Mr. Lafitte to Jesus. He was the assistant manager of the men's department. And I won Mr. Le Mr. Sharp's wife to Jesus on visitation one night. And I won Mr. Lafitte's wife to Jesus. <laughs> and then I won the manager of the men's department to Jesus. And then I won uh, Mrs. Post to Jesus, who sold hose in the ladies' department. And then I won her, her, her son Charles Post to Jesus. Uh, uh, and then I won Barbara Pruitt to Jesus. She was secretary up in the up in the office area. We had those little things. You put the money in, and you know, a little round thing, cylinder, and it, it scoots up the, up, you know, up the side of the, uh, up a, uh, and up to the office, and and she takes the chain money out, and puts the change in, gives her a seat, and it comes back down. Uh, I won Barbara to Jesus. I won Barbara's sister, <coughs> Mrs. Hall, to Jesus. I won Barbara's. Uh, brother-in-law, Sam Hall to Jesus. I won Barbara's dad and her mother to Jesus and didn't preach, never preach a sermon in J.C. Penney Company. Just every once in a while, I'd see somebody that had a heavy, heavy burden and I'd say, I know who can help you. Just kindly and graciously won them to Christ. I, uh, we built a new auditorium down in Texas. R.D. Estes was our Contractor, <coughs> big, <coughs> typical contractor, big 
old school a fella. RDS was just almost 70 years old then. We built a new auditorium. He came to my office for the last payment. Building was finished. Building up was dedicated soon. <coughs> I gave him his last check that had been signed by our men. He started to walk out. I said, Mr. Estes, I want to talk to you about another building. Boy, that perked him up. Oh, he said, another building. He thought he had another job. He said, what is it? And I said, this is not a building that you would build. It's a building that's been already built for you. He said, what do you mean? And I said, Mr. Estes, you've worked on this job for several weeks now or months. I've never taken time to tell you what I want to tell you, but I said, I do want to tell you this. I said, you're human, and you do have a need of God. Let me tell you how you can have a home in heaven that Jesus is building for you now. I went into class that day. I baptized, he was the second person baptized in that new baptistry. Who was the first? The fellow, that, the plumber that installed the baptistry. I want him to Jesus inside the baptistry while he was installing it. Now, in no case <laughs> did I walk up. <laughs> you know, some of you people think you've got to be a screwball or never talk about Jesus. I was out here in Hessville, soul winning one day. <clears throat> I rang the doorbell. Nobody came to the door. Fellas, I'm up here. <clears throat> Looked up. <clears throat> the guy was up a tree. He was pruning a tree. He said, I'll be down in a minute. I said, I'll come up. I climbed the tree. I sat on one limb. <clears throat> he sat on the other. Turned to Luke 19, the story of Zacchaeus, who was saved up the tree and got him saved. I was out in Munster one day. I still remember the guy's name. 20 years ago, named Bell. He was he was on his uh, he was on one of these little uh, rollers under his car, and uh, and so I, all I could see is a couple of feet sticking out. <laughs> and I said, "Mr. Bell, is that you?" <laughs> he said, "Yes, sir. Who is it?" I said, "It's the Hiles Mechanic Service." He said, "I didn't call a mechanic." <laughs> I said, "I wasn't called. I was sent." He said, "Okay." He didn't didn't see me. He's under the car. He said, "Get on a roller. Come on under here." I was dressed in a suit about like this. I got on that roller, back down, screwed that thing out of there. There he was over here, and I was over here. He said, what do you think the trouble is? Good night. I don't know. A carburetor <coughs> from a battery cable. <coughs> and uh, there were underneath that thing. All I could see is a bunch of grease. He said, what do you think's wrong? I said, I, I think you need a general overhauling. How can you tell from under here? I said, I'm a pretty good mechanic. <laughs> he looked over. He saw me laying there in a blue suit <laughs> beside him. He said, Mister, who in the world are you? <laughs> and I said, I'm Brother Hiles, pastor of First Baptist Church. He said, what are you doing under here? I said, you invited me under here. <laughs> he laughed and laughed and laughed. <laughs> He got out of thing. He went and told his wife. He laughed. He kept on laughing. And I told him about Jesus. And he got saved. And when he prayed, I'll never forget it. He said, Dear Lord, I'm coming for a general overhauling. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you decide to speak a good word about him? How sad it is for somebody like Elihu to have to say, I have yet to speak on God's behalf. Tonight, I have not spoken to hundreds of people, several thousand people. I have spoken to a small group of people who have not yet spoken on God's behalf. Could I ask you, as a minimum, couldn't you talk to your husband? Couldn't you talk to your wife? Couldn't you talk to your own children that you brought into the world? Couldn't you say a word to the lady that lives next door as you fertilize in the yard? Or you men, if your wife is sick, perhaps you're fertilizing the yard. Laugh when I tell them I haven't got time to stand up here and wait for it to soak in. You're the people who cause the service to last so long. <laughs> it's not my fault. I'm just waiting for you to respond. I saw a cartoon the other day. <laughs> A guy threatened to shoot the preacher, standing there with a gun, going to shoot him. Preacher said, go ahead. He said, it's been so long since I've had any response from preaching. I settled for that. 
you people that just... And, 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 and I love you. Really, I do. And I'm glad you're in this church. And I, I try to meet your needs. I really do. In my preaching. I just thought tonight I ought to talk to you for a few minutes. Not scold you. Not try to hurt you. Not try to rebuke you or offend you. But just sort of appeal to you because God saved you too. At least. At least. When you die. Don't have to say. I have yet to speak. On God's